Hang your fear at the door and join the future. Bronx-born Gerald Salente is a globally recognized trend forecaster. He's an independent thinker and citizen of the world who leads the prestigious Trends Research Institute in Kingston, New York. His institute is filled with experts who analyze everything from the future price of gold to whether or not we will continue to sip espressos, vote conservative, eat organic, buy laptops, or drink Diet Coke. Stay with us for what it will take to change the course of the future. Be prepared for the unexpected. It is my pleasure to be with you today and with global trend forecaster Gerald Salente. He is a close combat practitioner with a big brain and a voyaging mind. He's a trend tracker of great renown who is unafraid to predict the future. He publishes the Trends Journal and he leads an acclaimed institute that studies major trends with time proven accuracy, they say. No crystal balls, no tarot cards, no astrological charts in the mix? No. Just current events that are forming future trends. It's all in front of us. It's happening every day. Welcome to Vancouver. Thank you for having me. How did you get into the business of the trends business? Well, it began, of course, with my father, may his soul rest in peace. As I was a young boy, any time I'd be shooting off my mouth, he'd look at me and he'd say in Italian, Papagallo, parrot, stop repeating what everybody else is saying and think for yourself. Mm. And so I was one of those guys, even though I was of that generation, I didn't rebel. I knew that my aunts and uncles, my father, that they were, you know, they were cool cats, you know, that I knew I didn't know. So I'd never speak until I knew what I was speaking about. If I didn't have the facts, I wouldn't debate or give my opinion about anything. At a graduate school, I began running political campaigns in Westchester County in New York, which was, of course, the richest county in the, the country. Mm -hmm. And from there, they sent me to Albany, and I became the assistant to the secretary of the New York State Senate. And Fanny, that was the worst job I ever had. <laughs> Why? All day long, you'd watch grown men suck up to get their way to the top. And now grown women. Now grown women. <laughs> not too many women in, well, Bella Abzug or somebody yeah. like that, but yeah, not too many in yeah. the mix. So, you know, it wasn't for me. But it, so I ended up, I was teaching American politics and campaign technology at St. John's University, a course I designed. From there, I was a government affairs specialist in D.C. for several years. I used to put together political action committees for the chemical industry when political action committees first began. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah, so, and then... I guess I started growing up. One day I said to myself as I was sitting in the Hay Adams Hotel with a <laughs> bunch of suits around the table, I said, what am I doing here? This isn't for me. And what had just happened before that was Jimmy Carter had come back from Iran. Mm -hmm. Nothing really changes. And the Shah, of course, was in power then. And it was New Year's Eve, and he came back and went up to the microphones and said that the Shah is the island of stability in the Middle East. And I've been watching this thing coming down, and I've been reading about how the United States and Great Britain overthrew the democratically elected government of Mosaic Dag in 1953, and how the Shah was his brutal dictatorship, the Savak, the secret police. So when the riots started to happen, and millions of people are taken out to the streets, and I've been around politics long enough, when I heard this lines, that is when I became a political atheist. I no longer believe this stuff. I said, this thing is coming down. What will be the implications? And I realized that gold and oil prices would go up. So not knowing what I was doing, I started speculating in gold and oil futures. Smart. I bought my first buy of gold at $187.50 an ounce. And I began trading futures and made enough money where I quit my job. And I realized that if you look at things for what they are, not the way you want them to be, what you want, like what you wish for, what you hope, Get rid of the ideology. You go to a doctor, you get a diagnosis. It's no big deal. You don't care what, what nationality, what religion, what, what his, ide his political beliefs are. All you want is the diagnosis. Mm, but you do care if he's a good doctor. Exactly. That's all you care about. Doctor. That's all you care about. Mm -hmm. You don't care about their ideology. And unlike the presidential reality show that you see on TV with the national conventions, you don't care what, 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 what his wife and kids are like either. You just care about the diagnosis. So I only give the diagnosis. I don't get in, emotionally involved in, we should do this, we should do that, I want this, I want that. 
Uh, some of the best forecasters, however, have said that uh, uh, there has to be some shade of ambiguity in the forecast. Like, like you're there, you see the trend, but you have to be willing to move it around a bit, do you not? Only, nobody could predict the future. There are too many wild cards. I mean, we're all doing in life what we're doing because of decisions we made. And then there are the wild cards that flop in there. You know, so, so you can never predict anything. You can see the face of the future, see the way it's going to shape out, but you can't predict the exact movements of how it's going to be. For instance, how about this one? How about, a, how about an earthquake in Fukushima? Can't uh, predict that. Uh, no, but you do know that you're in a zone that an that, uh, earthquake is more likely to happen. Exactly. So why, then you say to yourself, why did they do it in the beginning? So, but you cannot, so there are always the wild cards, but you, could, you can see the way directions are moving. Sure, but you also say to yourself, well, we're in an earthquake zone. Should we have a nuclear power plant exactly. here? Uh, does it make sense? Is there another kind of energy we could use in a, uh, so when the earthquake comes, you know, there, there's not so much damage? That's why I'm a political atheist, because these things are made for political decisions. A citizen of the world, a political atheist, do you vote at all? I used to. I will not vote in this election. I don't know of any American that could be proud after seeing that last presidential debate. It was between an emperor with no clothes and a vulture capitalist craving for power. That's the way I see it. And again, my motto taught to me by my dear father, think for yourself. But I saw a spectacle over there. I mean, come on with this. You know, Eisenhower said it best. Mm -hmm. He said that any man or woman, any person that seeks the office, seeks the office, has to be either crazy or a megalomaniac. Well, Eisenhower was a much different Republican than, uh, than Bush. So what happens? As a trend forecaster, you look at it and you say, okay, there, there were the Eisenhower Republicans, now there are the Bush Republicans. What, what changed? It's a, it's a devolution of society. And it's a complete, look, I mean, you, could, you can measure it in every level. And in talking about the presidential reality show. Here, could you imagine, could you imagine Eisenhower going to the UN, giving a speech, not having time to meet with the world leaders because he has an interview on The View with the ladies of The View? Could you imagine Eisenhower sitting <laughs> at, with the ladies of The View? No, but I understand the power of television, as you do, and I understand that if you're trying to get the youth vote and you go on with David Letterman and play the saxophone, maybe you'll get the youth vote, and if you don't, maybe you won't. And so you asked me, what's the difference? And that's mm -hmm. what I said, it's a devolution. It's not about getting the vote, it's about integrity. It's about courage, as I see it. It's about respect of the office, the dignity of the office, and the dignity of the person. To me, this is a presidential reality show. That's all it is. It's a made-for-TV spectacle. So smoke and mirrors, smoke and mirrors. Now, going back to your Trend Institute, uh, what's the difference between a trend and a fad? Fads are short-lived, and, and they're they don't have the components. The trend usually has social, economic, and political developments within it. And they brought, it spans over a broader field. Fads, they come and they go. So the pet rock, a fad. A fad. Uh, long hair, beetle's hair. It's a fad, a all fad. those things. Uh, fat lips. We seem to have a lot of fat lips these days. <laughs> well, those, those again, Botox, you, yeah. a fad or a oh, trend? No, Botox is real, I mean, you know, because it's you have real. an aging baby boom population, an aging population. And again, it went back to what you were talking about, about playing the saxophone on the television, getting the youth vote. So it's that mentality. So people are stuck into the mentality of the time. So that, I'll tell you, one of the big, biggest businesses that there's going to be is with baby boomers. I mean, they're the most of them out there, and they're mm -hmm. going deaf, blind, and out of their mind. Mm -hmm. And our knees are hurting. Yeah, so this is going to be a huge. And another big trend that we're coming out with in, uh, in our top trends for 2013 a little sneak preview of one of two of them actually. One is safe foods. I coined the term clean foods years ago back in the 90s. This is going to be safe foods. Safe food is going to be a big issue. 
You, look, you know, there's so many parallels going on between now and what happened in the 1920s and 30s. You had the crash of 29, you had the, the, the Dust Bowl, you mm -hmm. had currency wars, you had trade wars, and then world war. We had the Panic of 08, we have, we have a Great Depression, there's a depression going on in a lot of the world. You have the Dust Bowl is happening, you have 63% of the United States that are in drought conditions. You have drought conditions over here in a place that rains a lot. Mm -hmm. You're a Montana girl. 80% mm -hmm. of the area in the United States where, they're f where they feed the, the animals, feed animals, is in drought, 80%. So what we're looking at now is, and now of course the currency wars are going on, you turn it into the, the uh, presidential reality show, they're bashing China trade wars. So what I'm going back to is that there's going to be food shortages. There's going to be a, not food shortages in the sense that you can get that cheap stuff with the GMO if that's what you mm -hmm. like, if that's your trip. But to the get golden rice. Yeah, but to get really, really high quality, safe foods that you know that's going to when you eat it, it's going to be nutritious for you and beneficial. There's going to be shortages of that we're forecasting. So do you see a trend in North America, in the richer countries? Uh, grow your own. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Matter of fact, you know, we're telling people, you know, rip up those front lawns that you, the, the mm -hmm. grass that you can't eat or smoke. What sure. is it? Exactly. You know? Get your lawn off drugs. <laughs> yeah. Get your lawn off grass. <laughs> yeah. Grow some corn. Grow some uh, veg. Uh, yeah. Bring it. Pear home. trees. Great barberries. Make it beautiful rather than mm. an ugly thing. Why not? With chemicals. Use the land yeah. to, its, to its best advantage. Edible landscaping. Edible landscaping. I like the idea, uh, it, it, depending on where you live, because there are countries where, as you suggest, uh, there isn't enough water. There's no clean water. Uh, HIV AIDS rampant, all of that. So whether well, yeah, you're growing your own or not course, is not a big yeah, issue. Yeah, right. uh, last battles fought over water. What's that trend about? Excuse me. The last battles will be fought over water on this planet if we Probably. don't change yes, our ways. Absolutely. You know, people say they debate whether or not there's uh, you know climate change or global warming. Mm -hmm. Just to put it, make it really simple. If you're dumping in trillions and trillions of tons and gallons of pollutants into the air, into the water, into the food, into your bodies. You think it's going to have an effect on anything? I and mean, we need a scientific study. Yeah, the earth is changing rapidly. You look at the numbers coming out in this last year. They're record-breaking, whether it's ice melt up in the Arctic, mm. whether it's whether it's the drought conditions that have been the worst, you look at the prices of commodities or how they've been going up, and then you look at the population increase. Just to put this in perspective, go back 100,000 years ago, it took from 100,000 years ago to 1900 to put 1.5 billion people on the planet. Now we're going up to the seven billion sure, we're number getting, in a hundred years. And we're, we're getting to nine, as you know, yeah. and uh, we're overfishing. So somebody said to me the other day, uh, quite an intelligent young man, uh, there, uh, by 2050, no more fish. If the, if the ocean keeps warming, uh, we'll overfish it and the fish will die and there'll be no more fish. And it, goes back it. To, and it goes back to what you said. Why would they build an earthquake on an earthquake, uh, a, pow, a nuclear power right. plant on an earthquake? But so. why aren't we talking about that in presidential debates and prime ministerial debates? Why isn't that at the top of the agenda? Because of who these people are, and this is what people don't seem to understand. These are the same people you couldn't stand in high school and college <laughs> that wanted to be class president and head of the student council. <laughs> You're sure. Oh, look, at, I can't make this up. Look at Paul Ryan. He was, he was voted by his classmates Brown Noser of the Year. He was class president, prom president. They follow their career course. I was there, I know what they look like. And I don't like them. I don't like any, you know what, you know what I think could change the world? Take one of the countries that does it the best. Good place to live, food is nice, everything's nice mm. and clean, everybody owns guns, they don't kill each other. Switzerland, direct democracy. Let the people vote. You want to go to war? Let the people vote. You want to give money to the bailout, the big banks? Let the people vote. If we could bank online, we could vote online. If we could move trillions of dollars a day around the planet, mm -hmm. we could vote. Did you see the social media trend coming? Oh, Internet, I, social media, Facebook? Not only did I see it coming when I wrote Trends 2000 in 1996, I coined the term techno-tribalism, which social media is only a derivative of.
Interesting. Uh, somebody coined high tech, high touch. It could have been the Nesbits who wrote yeah. Megatrends. We will live eventually in an information loaded society and in a high tech, high touch society, and we will need touch. And when we come back, let's talk about that. Okay. Okay.